Happy New Year. Please stand by for the fourth annual New Year's speech from the Sovereign of Seattle. For the past four years, King Caston has tried to bring hope and vision to the Pacific Northwest in ways that politicians can't. This year, the speech is dedicated to the thousands of Seattle residents experiencing homelessness. And special recognition is given to the great work on the part of the Young Women's Christian Association of Seattle, who helped children like my daughter. And provide assistance to mothers like my mama, every day, including immigrants from all around the world. If you are a mother experiencing homelessness and have children that need preschool care, Angeline's Day Room provides daycare and overnight winter shelter through the downtown Seattle YWCA. Thank you, King Caston, for the opportunity to highlight what we do. Y un saludo especial a todas las personas nuevas, sin importar de donde sean. King Caston Ray les da la bienvenida a todos los nuevos residentes de Seattle. Incluidos los inmigrantes y refugiados. Especialmente, ya sean documentados o indocumentados. If you please to stand up or to sit like I am sitting down right here, they are gonna sing the king's song. And then, the king is going to say stuff. At least I think he is. He is supposed to. And we have been waiting like 20 minutes. And my name is Aria and I live in Seattle. And my favorite color is purple. And I want to say thank you to Angeline and her room, Angeline's room, and all the people in it for my daycare. It is really fun. And when we get a house or an apartment one day, I hope soon, I am going to tell my mom that my room is going to be purple. And thanks for listening to me, and to Dominique, and to Jean, and Maria, and Alana, how it's snack time. So I'm gonna eat girl cheese, cause it's my favorite. And here now, from Seattle, His Majesty the King. Who could argue with that? With an introduction like that, you can imagine that I'm under a lot of pressure right now. It was advised to me moments ago that I could have cut right to my speech instead of having such a long introduction. After all, it was said to me, I am the one that they came to listen to, not them. But I firmly, firmly disagree, if you don't mind. In fact, I say that the voices that you have just heard from are far more important 
on any day to listen to than mine is. I am feeling, as you can imagine, a lot of pressure from public scrutiny, which is nothing new for me, but the expectations could not be higher, neither could the stakes. I am under pressure to impress my boyfriend, first on the list, because he's first in my heart, whom has a very encouraging nature but a very critical eye and a sharp tongue. From my parents, who are wondering whether or not the son that they sent out to the West Coast those many years ago from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is ever going to succeed, or if he is failing miserably already. From old friends, who are wondering where the person that they knew went, the person that could walk into a room, command it, command any debate, get laws changed and new policies passed for the greater good, and where he's been. From new friends, who may be listening to the speech and wondering right about now whether the person that they just met isn't certifiably insane with access to a voice recorder. To Jeffrey Smith, Susan Farentino, Dr. Marie Gray, and Dr. Ben Schaefer, and all of the other teachers, professors, and mentors that I've had who have taught me anything, anything at all worth a damn, and wondering what I've done with the knowledge that they gave me. To all of the people who are listening to this speech as a joke, who think this whole king thing is a joke, and who are belittling, mocking, and making fun of every word that I speak to you. To all the people who are listening to this speech not at all as a joke, but who are looking to me for leadership and to point the way towards something that transcends the pettiness of left and right and the grim, often brutal and harsh reality of the era and the world in which we find ourselves in. To those people who don't know what I'm all about, who are listening for the first time perhaps, and who are wondering what of anything useful I have to contribute to the conversation and why they should listen to me at all. To Jaron's ghost and his family, who are wondering whether I'm ever going to succeed at getting anything close to resembling justice for him after COVID derailed our plans. To Sebastian, who's wondering where his dinner is, and to myself, and there be no harsher judge than the one I see in my own eyes. But of everyone that I just mentioned, including me, I am certain that there aren't any more important than the women and the children who make use of the facilities at or who reside at Angeline's Room and Angeline's Day Room at the YWCA in downtown Seattle. I am terrified that I might fail on them, and I cannot let them down. And thank you to all of them for a wonderful introduction, especially to Aria. And by the way, Purple is my favorite color, too. And so, if you're just joining us, hello and good evening, or good morning, especially to Connor Hyde, who is a young man, transitional between homes in Seattle, who just woke up from a 20-day coma. Good morning, Connor. I'm so glad that you're awake. New Year's is a time for reflection just as much as Christmas is a time for renewal, as well as many other things, as well as many other holidays this time of year. And I look forward to New Year's because it gives me an opportunity to speak to all of you from my heart, from my very soul, no matter what your background might be, no matter what gender you identify as, no matter who you are or who you love, no matter what nation it is that you call home or homeland, come from or are from, no matter where you might be, whether you are in Cascadia or beyond Cascadia, whatever culture you come from, whatever language that you speak. But tonight, most especially, this speech is dedicated to every man, woman, and child who is sleeping tonight without a home, perhaps under a sea of stars, or with a cardboard box as their ceiling, or a tent in a public park, or over a thoroughfare on a bridge, 
or under one. To every person that that applies to, and to every person who might be on Grinder or Tinder or other such apps tonight, changing their sexual orientation in exchange for a safe place to sleep. To all of you, on behalf of my boyfriend, my family, and myself, we send to you our love and solidarity, no matter where you are. And please remember, especially tonight, perhaps by no one more than me, you are not forgotten. You will never be forgotten. Will you please allow me the great honor tonight to speak to the world on your behalf as your representative? That is a great responsibility, and it usually involves some sort of declaration and a promise and a commitment, and I intend to make that to you now. Channeling, I would think and hope, a certain queen whose passing we all still mourn and sorely miss. These serious thoughts that this brings, these thoughts of life looming ahead with all of its challenges, also brings opportunities. And now that we are coming to a certain maturity, it is, I would think, a great happiness for all of us to know that we can take some of the burden off of those in our society who support us, like our families, our elders, parents, and friends who fought, worked, and suffered to protect our childhoods, as well as the doctors, nurses, and frontline workers to whom we owe a debt of gratitude for safeguarding our health and vouchsafing our future during the dark and dismal and uncertain days of COVID-19. If we all know the way ahead together is one that we must walk together each of us with an unwavering faith a high courage and a quiet heart then we will be able to make of this great cascadia that we all love so dearly an even greater and grander thing a place and a society more free more kind more prosperous more optimistic more inclusive more happy and a more powerful influence for good and greatness in the world than has ever been known before. It has been said by the writer William Pitt of England that England saved herself by her exertions, but she will save the world by her example. I think we can do one even better. Because in order to accomplish this, we must give nothing less than the whole of ourselves. Channeling that certain queen, I would say that there's a motto born in my family, the Evans family, which has been born by many of my ancestors as well. Two, in fact, a very noble and royal motto. Tenax, Latin for tenacity, something my father reminds me of on a daily basis. And pro coronam et patria, for my crown and my country. Those words are an inspiration to me as they have been to all of my ancestors when they made their dedications to the crown when they came to maturity. I cannot quite do as they did, but through the inventions of 21st century science, I can do what wasn't possible for any of them. I can make an active dedication with the whole of an empire and the world listening. I will even have a ring to confirm this commitment that I'm making to you now in a few days. I'd like to make that dedication to you. It is a very simple one. I declare before all of you now that my whole life, whether it be long or whether it be short, will be devoted to you, to your service, and to the service of our great imperial family, this great imperial family, to which we all, every single one of us, belongs. Like Queen Elizabeth I, I do announce to you that I am, in fact, married to all of you. And I will not have the strength to carry out that commitment alone unless you join, it, join in it with me. I invite you to do that. And I hope God helps me keep good my vow. And God bless every one of you who are willing with me to share in it for I am devoted to you. Every day means every day. Now, what does that mean? Well, put simply, it means exactly that. Every day 
means every day. At a very low point in my life, about one year ago, I made a promise to my boyfriend, Anthony, who is wonderful. And I said to him, when he was giving me a second chance that I definitely, certainly, absolutely did not deserve, that I would keep all of my promises that I made to him. He rolled his eyes. We'll see, he said. The first promise I made to him was to make him breakfast every day. And I did. Every day that he stayed over, I made him breakfast. The days that I forgot were the days that I forgot, but they were few and far between. Other days, he made himself breakfast, but 87.97% of the time, according to my calculations, I made him more than 200 breakfasts since then. Keeping one's promises is important. Being true to one's word is important. And I will be true to every word that I'm speaking to you now. I have kept my word through every part of my life to every person I've given it to this year, sometimes to my detriment, but I've always fulfilled it. If I make a promise now, my word is as good as law, and you can be sure that it will be fulfilled. Sometimes they don't have expiration dates either, as I found out when Anthony and I were enjoying a nice afternoon when I received a phone call from Melanie Roper of Edwardsville, Pennsylvania, a former constituent of mine when I was in politics in the 2nd District of Luzerne County from 2010 to 2014. Melanie called me irate and distraught. Her mother passed away during COVID-19. She was a lieutenant in the United States Army, specifically with the Legion of Nurses during Vietnam, and she devoted her life to the BA administration, giving health, healing, and support to wounded veterans coming home from overseas. Her mom passed away. They weren't allowed to attend the funeral due to COVID-19. A third party had her mother's remains and buried her. They had to actually hunt down where the cemetery was so they could visit her mother's grave after the fact. They never even got a flag. Due to how that was handled and a paperwork issue, Melanie was looking at set settling her mother's estates and grave financial misfortune in the future. She called me because she had no idea what else to do, and she knew that I would pick up the phone, and I did. In front of Anthony, which is a very rare treat for me, he got to see me in political mode. I called up staffers and congressmen, and I got them to work. And thank you so very much to the staffers of Congressman Matthew Cartwright of Pennsylvania, as well as Pennsylvania Congresswoman Susan Wild, especially Sabrina McLaughlin and Rebecca A. Salmon, who helped us out. And not only were we able to get that straightened out, but also we were able to allow Melanie to settle her mother's accounts and estates, and we did her one better. More than just a simple flag presented off of a shelf, folded up, we presented her with a flag that was flown over the United States Capitol in honor of and in the name of, specifically on that day for her mother. And we presented that to her with the thanks and the gratitude of a grateful nation for a great woman. Melanie, may your mother rest in peace and rise in glory. We love you and we miss you and we miss her too. Justice for Jaren is still on. Although we did not catch the fire last year that I hoped we would catch, as I said in last year's speech, this year we were given an unlikely opportunity randomly by happenstance. And I do announce that thank you very much to Mr. Jake Chapman of Cairo News in Seattle, Washington, but Jaren will get his day to have his say. We may not get it in a court of law, but we will get it in the court of public opinion and the media. Mr. Chapman has promised us action and a report on Jaren for the news. We will participate and we are looking forward to finally, finally letting Jaren have his say. Jaren, wherever you are, I love you. And I miss you every day. <clears throat> Always bear in mind, everyone, 
who loves you enough in life to fight for the honor of your ghost. That opportunity came as Seattle was reacting to the terrorist attacks in North Carolina from a group that calls itself the Alt-Right. They attacked power stations in North Carolina, and Mr. Chapman was interviewing me about the Denny substation power station here in Seattle, Washington. I participated in that news report, and although it did not make the cut of the news report that was on the news broadcast, he did ask me two questions. One, what message do I have to Seattle? Keep calm and carry on, I said. And what message did I have for the terrorists? And I will confess, I didn't have any. I didn't have any words to share. I didn't have any ideas to try to communicate. Because Seattle does not negotiate with terrorists. We end them. I said, and I say that now, and that is all I have to say to a terrorist. We had to say goodbye to some people that we love very much this year. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, what can we say of? It would be inelegant of me, I would think, to add to the already innumerable tributes made, except, Mom, we love you and we will never forget you. We also had to say goodbye to many people that we love in our personal life. Sean Cox, dearly beloved friend of my boyfriend Anthony, passed away. Mike Haig, a childhood friend of mine whom I used to make tree forts with in the forest, passed away from brain cancer just a few days ago. And Lance Nielsen, Beloved husband of Darlene Nielsen, Jaren's dad, and father to Jaren, my late partner, passed away from illness unexpectedly this year. Lance, it feels like we've hardly known you. We love you and we miss you too. And we recommit ourselves to justice for Jaren in Lance's name. And we make this promise to his widow, Darlene. And I know something of what it means to be a widow. Darlene, you are still our family. No matter how far away we might be, no matter how many years might be between our seeing each other, you are still my family. I would like to recall one instance where Lance and I had a real bonding. When we stood at Stonewall Inn in New York City, yes, the Stonewall, where the gay rights movement started, Jaron and his mother were with us that day, and they looked at the place as though this is just a bar. They understood the history, but they didn't get it. Lance and I, however, we got it. We were in awe of the place and its majesty. This is where it happened, we said. And we had our moment, our true moment of bonding. We understood what they just didn't. The history, the awe-inspiring grandeur of this simple establishment where we stood. We knew that we stood in the shadows of giants to whom our rights as people are owed. I will never forget you, Lance. Be with us always. The gay rights movement is important, especially for those of us who grew up in the Bush administration openly gay. And Mike Haig, who I also mentioned passed away from brain cancer just a few days ago, is someone who I personally owe a debt of gratitude to, and I would like to pay a very brief tribute to him now. Because if it weren't for him, and his very tall, very large body protecting me from the kids in school who would otherwise have put my head down toilets and made me lose a few teeth if they could have their way on a daily basis, I would be nowhere. He saved my ass more than once. We grew up three doors up from one another. I've known him since I was a small boy. Mike, Godspeed, and welcome to eternity. And thank you for everything. Mike had a very simple philosophy. 
never complain, but never explain. We were of very different religious beliefs. He grew up a very conservative Christian, and I was very privileged to be, and honored actually, to be invited by his family to go to their church on several occasions. And though I took a very different path, being openly gay and something that his denomination of Christianity is not exactly cogent with, still, he never once had an argument with me, never once had a disagreement with me, never once treated me any different than he would otherwise treat his best friend. Mike and I never once had any difference of opinion because we just ex we just exiled him from our conversations. We only focused on the good and we never rewarded the bad. And for that, I've seen and have been privileged to know in life a wonderful man as Mike Hag, who has touched every life that he's ever met with kindness, generosity of spirit, and magnanimity of soul. And the world is worse off without him in it. And now we turn to the light of life and possibilities thereof. There are so many of you who are devoting yourselves and committing yourselves and marrying one another on Facebook. It is hard to keep up. Please keep those pictures coming. It is such a joy to see so many people of our generation hearing the call to start families and new possibilities for their future. And it inspires one to pay tribute in this moment to he whom I would be no man without, my boyfriend, Anthony. Anthony is patient and he's kind. We have issues like any partnership would have, but we always work through them because we love one another and we respect one another. We listen to one another. Sometimes it might take us a little bit longer than we would hope, but we always do because we care for one another. We've learned to be kind to one another. And I know that whatever my future with Anthony holds, my relationship with him has taught me one thing, especially good advice for those who are marrying, that if you wish to make a lifetime vow to somebody, you best be living that vow yourself before you ask them to come in on it with you. I won't say what that's going to reveal about our future one way or the other, because honestly, I don't know. All I know is I, I am enjoying every moment I get to spend with Anthony, and I hope he enjoys every moment he gets to spend with me. He's the best, and more than worthy of a partner to have. Now, and here's hoping, in the years to come. And that's all I'll have to say about that, for now. May all of you, each and every single one of you, be blessed in your relationships moving forward. And may your families be large and happy. And last, but certainly not least, my mother. My mother is a wonderful woman. She's the toughest woman I know. Mom, I hope you don't mind that your Christmas present is a little bit late, but it's a very good one. Thanks to the Royal Principality of Sealand, sovereign and independent, six miles off of the coast of Suffolk, England, you shall be, in due time, the Countess Evans. Surprise, and Merry Christmas, Mom. I'm grateful, very grateful, to those great men, and great they are, who gave me look when overlooked I went by almost everybody. Without them, I'm not sure where I would be. But I know I'm grateful for all of them. To my parents, to Anthony, and to all of you. I look forward to working very hard to make sure that I am making good the vow that I have made to you tonight. Because after all, as we've already established, one should be living a vow before one asks anyone else to come in on it with him. And so, may 2023 bring all of you the best, the brightest, and the greatest of gifts that God can give you. And may you have a most audacious and auspicious new year. Thank you, and good night. I heard there was a secret chord that David played, and it pleased the Lord. But you don't really care for music, do you? It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, and the major lift, the baffled king composing 